This brief was created with open source information ready available on the internet as well as books. However, some aspects of the ship's operational careers or statistics have been withheld due to the lack of information, the loss over time, as well as being kept secret due to said country's official secret acts. The Russian cruiser Gromoboy was an armed cruiser of the Imperial Russian Navy, being built by the Baltic Works in St. Petersburg, being laid down on June 14th, 1897, and being launched just under two years later, being commissioned in November of 1899. She would be a one-ship class designed for long-range commerce rating, displacing 12,455 tons, she would be 146.6 metres long, a 20.9 metre beam, and a draft of 7.9 metres. She'd be powered by three vertical triple expansion engines being fed from 32 water tube boilers powering three shafts to 19 knots. Her range would be 8,100 nautical miles at 10 knots, excellent for the role of the long-range commerce raider role that she was designed for. This long range might be good as Imperial Russia didn't really have that many overseas territories they can actually refuel from. So, yeah, long range was good. The ships would be armed with four single 8-inch 45 caliber guns in open mounts capable of firing out to 8.9 nautical miles or 17.5 thousand yards. 16 single 6-inch 45 caliber guns in casemates capable of firing out to 8.34 nautical miles or just under 17,000 yards at around about 2 to 7 rounds per minute. 24 single 75mm 50 caliber guns capable of firing out to 4.2 nautical miles or just over 8,500 yards for the anti-torpedo boat work. 12 single 3-pounder Hotchkiss cannons capable of firing out to 1.14 nautical miles or 2,020 yards for, again, the anti-torpedo boat work. 18 single 37mm guns capable of firing out to 1.7 nautical miles at or 3,038 yards. These weapons were the last line of defence against those pesky torpedo boats. And finally, 4 15-inch torpedo tubes, 2 per broadside, capable of firing the Whitehead torpedo. The ship's armour would be made of Krupp Harvey steel, with a belt thickness of about 6 inches, the deck was 3 inches, tapering down to about 1.5 inches, and the conning tower was, believe it or not, 12 inches thick. So with all that fitted, the Gromma Boy was intended to be a repeat of the preceding Rosier which was the preceding armoured cruiser that Russia had actually built. But the design of the Rosier was actually modified for thicker armour and improved engines. However, they would actually share the same hull, making the two ships very, very similar. The only visible difference between the two ships was the Grand Boy would actually have two vertical casements abreast the bridge, whereas on the Rosier, she'd only actually have the upper one. It's a good way of indicating which one you're actually looking at when it comes to pictures. So, once completed and operational, it was found that the ship would have an absolutely abysmal trim. Now what does it actually mean? Well, her bow was lower in the water than it actually should have been, and this greatly reduced her speed and made her very, very wet in anything more than a sea state one. So the crew would have to store all the food ammunition and stores to the rear of the ship, as well as flooding some of the after tanks and compartments to counter the absolutely abysmal trim. With this fixed, she was actually regarded as a good sea boat, although she would have an easy time rolling if not having a rapid roll speed. But, however, she was actually regarded as a good sea boat due to the fact that she came back to the centre line quite easily and quite quickly. Her active service wouldn't actually start off great however. She ran aground by sea ice on the way to Kronstadt for final fitting out. After three days she got free and she needed repairs to her sheathing of, weirdly, wood and copper, 
don't know why you wouldn't make the bottom of the ship out of, uh, I don't know, metal, but hey-ho. Never mind, this is Russia. They do some really weird things. So, she would leave for Leopaya on the 10th of December 1900, where, en route, she stopped off at Kiel and Plymouth, where she'd be inspected by Prince Harry of Prussia and naval officers, respectively. During the transit to the Far East, she stopped off down under in Sydney, where she represented Russia at the granting of the Constitution of Australia. With a brief stop in Melbourne, she sailed for Nagasaki in July. She finally arrived in Port Arthur on July 21st, 1901, a trip of about six months. Not bad time, to be honest. Beat the uh, second Pacific Squadron time a few years later, but hey, that's a different story, and I'm not even going to touch on that because Drax's done a really good video or two videos on that one. Anyway, she'd be in Port Arthur when the Russo Japanese War kicked off. She would be assigned to the Vladivostok Cruiser Squadron under the command of Rear Admiral Karl Yessen. The other ships of the squadron consisted of her, her half sisters Rosia and Rurik along with the protected cruiser, the Bogateur. During the early days of the war, she and the cruiser squadron sailed to intercept Japanese shipping, but only one mission was actually successful, when they sank the Japanese merchantman, the Hitachi Maru, who was carrying 18 11-inch sea terraces and over a thousand troops who were destined for Port Arthur. The ships returned to port and would be blockaded by Japanese surface forces. By August 10th, Attempted to make a break for Vladivostok, but turned back after Battle of the Yellow Sea. Now, Admiral Yesen was ordered to rendezvous with forces at Vladivostok, but the order was delayed. The ships had to raise steam and did not sortie until the evening of August 13th. Bogota had been damaged earlier when she ran aground and did not sail with the squadron. By dawn, they had reached the island of Tsushima in the strait between Korea and Japan. He turned back for Vladivostok when he failed to see any of the ships from the Port Arthur Squadron. 36 miles north of the island, he encountered the Japanese squadron, commanded by Vice Admiral Kamimuro Hikajo, tasked to patrol the Tsushima Strait. The Japanese forces had four modern armoured cruisers, the Awate, Izumo, Tokawa and Azuma. However, the two squadrons had actually passed during the night, without spotting one another, and each had reversed course around first light. This put the Japanese ships between the Russians and their route back to Vladivostok. In what would become the Battle of Ulsan, Gromoboy suffered 87 dead and 170 wounded. She was hit 15 times on the starboard side and 7 times on her port side, plus other hits to her funnels, boats and deck. She also suffered a fire caused by the ignition of excess propellant charges. Despite this number of hits, she was not actually badly damaged because her belt had not been penetrated. She would be repaired within two months by the rudimentary facilities available at Vladivostok. Now, immediately following the repairs, she ran aground outside of Vladivostok on August 13th and was not ready to sail until February of 1905. The Russians took the opportunity to reinforce her armament with six more 6-inch guns mounted on her upper decks, protected by lightly armoured casements. Her armament was rearranged, as well as her foremost 6-inch gun was moved from its weird casement to the forecastle, and the rearmost 6-inch gun was also moved forward. Room for these changes was made by removing many of her lighter guns. She retained only 19 75mm and two 37mm guns. She also received several Bar and Stroud rangefinders at this time. While testing her new radio equipment on the 24th of May, she struck a mine near her forward boiler room. She was able to return to Vladivostok for repairs, but took no further part in the war. After the war, she returned home to the Baltic Fleet where she was given a lengthy refit period that lasted until 1911. Her boilers and engines were reconditioned and her aft torpedo tubes were removed. The forward ones would be replaced by 18-inch ones and aesthetically, her fore and mizzen mast would be switched around. The main mast would be ditched 
and other improvements included the addition of gun shields around some of the upper deck guns as well as increasing the upper deck casements to a armor thickness of about two inches the armored towers fore and aft were built for rangefinders her light armament was reduced to four 75 mm guns and four 47 mm guns engine trials conducted in late 1910 were found to be unsatisfactory as the engines were overheating at anything but reliable power the trials were run again in july of 1911 and they were more satisfactory and she reached around about 18.5 knots all in all very good but there was a storm brewing in europe and world war one begun so with war now declared Grand Boy was serving with the 2nd Cruiser Brigade of the Baltic Fleet, but she would be modified to become a quote-unquote fast mine layer with the capability to carry around about 200 mines. By August of 1915, she engaged the German battlecruiser von der Tann at the entrance of the Gulf of Finland, but neither was hit. The captain probably thought, screw this, and made Billy Big Steps in the other direction. Between 1916 and 1917, her armament would be changed. She exchanged the 6-inch guns on the bow and stern for 8-inch weapons, and all her remaining light guns were removed and replaced with anti-aircraft guns. This would bring her displacement up to, right about now, 13,200 tons. She was quite a heavy girl. So all this work had now finished, and it was Russia, November 1917 with a little thing called the October Revolution. And that was going on. So, yeah, I know. October Revolution, happening in November. It's Russia. It's a little bit weird. Without any more absolutely abysmal Russian accents, we're going to continue before I guess into a gulag. So, by this point, she came under control of the Red Fleet, which is quite bad. And with the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litvosk, this required the Soviets to evacuate their base in Helsinki in March 1918, or have all the ships interned by the newly independent Finnish. However, the Gulf of Finland was still iced over. It became a slight problem. But all the ships, including the Gromoboy, reached Kronstadt, with the voyage being known as the Ice Voyage. Yeah, I know. Oh well, we're just going to call Sailing Through Some Ice the Ice Voyage, because that's never happened before. You know, it is what it is. So, upon arrival, she would actually be placed into reserve slightly after she actually turned up. But by October of 1920, her crew mutinied and took control of the ship of Kronstadt. In a move, probably taken from the plot of a Hollywood summer blockbuster, they would kill the commissar, kill the officers, and in a final middle finger to the Bolsheviks, they scuttled the ship by opening the seacocks. She remained on the bottom until she was refloated two years later and sold to a German company for scrapping. But guess what? She ran aground again, but this time in a storm. I guess we can let her off a little. She couldn't be moved and basically she was scrapped where she sat. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, so that's the end of that video. Hopefully you learned something new, because I most certainly did. Now, if you want to go and support the channel, there is a link in the description below to the Patreon page. I would recommend doing it, but it's up to you. Also, if you want to come and talk to me, there's a link in the description for the Discord channel. There's a couple of good guys over there. We talk about a wide variety of stuff. So yeah, so thanks for watching, guys. Hit that notification button to stay up to date with what I'm uploading. And obviously give it a like, give it a subscribe if you really want to, and comments are always good. I like reading your comments. So take care. Catch you next time.